Should we start? Let's go ahead. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jen Mixes Olds. I'm from the University of New Hampshire, where I serve as the director of the Center for Acoustics Research and Education. And I am the chair of the Committee on Ocean Acoustics Education and Expertise. Um, there's a whole um, committee panel or, that we will introduce in just a second. Um, and this today is the Early Career Information Gathering Panel. So as part of this committee and our activities, we are hosting um, three or four different information gathering panels that will help inform the committee members in writing the report at the, final, at the end of this um, Committee on Ocean, Ocean Acoustics Education and Expertise. This is the second panel that we have engaged in. And the goals for today is to collect information and perspectives from early career um, individuals to inform the committee's report. Um, we are going to talk about two different aspects. Um, we're gonna talk about what you thought about and how your experience was with ocean acoustics and acoustics as you move from um, your academic program into the workforce and um, insights on entering the workforce and what the job market was as you took that step. So as I said, we are, we are a committee um, joined online today. We've got Andrea Anguelas from Penn State, uh, Art Baggerer from MIT, Liesl Hodling from Eidos Education, Mujang Li from the University of Washington, Carolyn Rupel from the U.S. Geological Survey, Gail Scowcroft from the University of Rhode Island, and Preston Wilson from the University of Austin, Texas. Um, one thing that I definitely would like to encourage panelists and anyone from the public, after this panel, if you have lingering thoughts that you wanted to make sure get captured, you are more than welcome to email me, Carolyn Bell, who works with us um, from the National Academy side, or any of the committee members. Go to the next slide. So here is the statement of task for this National Academies Committee. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. Hopefully um, you have seen this already, so this is not new, but I do want to highlight the four different aspects that we um, are gonna talk about today. It's really nice, this panel covers all four of them. So um, we'll be looking at the state of education for ocean acoustics in the United States right now, um, an examination of the workforce demand that you experienced during your career, the skill sets or competencies needed to meet the workforce demand, and then we'll take a look at how the needs um, are not being met and strategies for elevating not only ocean acoustics education, but careers in ocean acoustics. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so this report's really going to cover quite a few items. Things that, uh, questions that we have for you will cover today, um, academic institutions you came from in, that offered courses or didn't offer courses in ocean acoustics or other acoustics related subdisciplines. Um, what is the expertise that was required as you moved into um, your job after being in academia? What are the ocean acoustic workforce needs in your sector or region? Um, other training programs you may have engaged in during your education? Um, so all of these things I hope that we'll touch on today and can keep these sort of in the back of your mind because these are the things we really hope to get at as we sit down as a committee to prepare this report. Next. It's right. over. I will take it over. Um, thank you, Jen. Uh, my name is Caroline Bell. I'm the study director from the National Academy's Ocean Studies Board. Um, so staff behind our committee working on this um, project on ocean acoustics education and expertise. Just a few logistical items, please. Um, remain muted for um, our committee panelists and, um, partic and public participants that are joining us um, unless you are speaking 
and uh, we ask that you would raise your hand or use the chat feature in Zoom for any questions. We will be giving priority to our committee members as this is an information gathering session for the committee to help inform their report. Uh, but as there's time at the end of the Q&A period, um, we will also take questions from the, the public audience. And uh, if, as you are speaking, please turn your cameras on or keep your cameras on to the extent possible um, to help have a sense of community, even though we are all in different locations on our, our Zoom screens. Um, and just a reminder again that this session is being recorded. It will be put uh, posted on the project website and then we'll, I'll put the project website in the chat for anyone who would like to visit it. Um, and also my email address, if there are any questions following this session, um, please feel free to, free to reach out. And then just briefly, I'll run through the agenda before we kick off our panel. Um, so here shortly, we're going to hear from our panelists, as you can see, uh, all different stages of early career um, personnel in uh, ocean acoustics and, and acoustics. And then we'll have about an hour for Q&A um, and adjourn the meeting at 2.30. So with that, I will turn it back over to Jen. Excellent. I This is one of my favorite topics that we're doing the panels on because you guys um, have the insight at the transition. You're early enough in your career that you're, you still have insight and feelings about what it was to transition from academia into your workforce. And so I think that this is an excellent opportunity for us to understand where the field is meeting its objectives in ocean acoustics education and where we can continue to improve. So with that, I'd like you to um, introduce yourself, where you're from, um, and what sector that you are working in, because I think we have a nice broad range of sectors here, and um, to really understand what sector you're from to make sure to, to, in, to introduce that part of you also. So we're gonna go first. Um, I guess we can go in alphabetical order. And let's see, who do we wanna go for first? Hold on just a second. We have to see who's first alphabetically. Ayulek uh, Chawarski, please. Hi everybody, my name is Ulek uh, Chawarski. Um, I am a uh, PhD student at Memorial University and uh, I've been working in consulting over the last few years um, as I finished my PhD and now I'm working full-time at ASL Environmental Sciences. And I primarily use hydroacoustics or some call it bioacoustics, but it's the use of active sonar or active echo sounders to measure the distribution of biological backscatter in the water column. And I use that as a tool to support studies in uh, marine ecology and spatial ecology. Thanks. All right, thank you. And just your sector, you are a for-profit private industry company, correct? ASL, environmental sciences? Yeah, I, I contract in academic institutions, but uh, currently I also work, um, let's say three quarter time in private for-profit industry. Thank you very much. Um, Ishan Bot. Thank you. Um, I made one slide that would be helpful to share that I can give a background for. I can come up, please. Excellent. Thank you. So my name is Ishan. Um, I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. But I guess in my, I'm going to do two minutes maybe. I wanted to impress upon the, the audience here that my path into ocean acoustics is primarily driven by chance. And so it started off um, at Duke University, I was pursuing a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. And I knew I was interested in something environmental, but wasn't sure what that was. And again, very randomly ended up at a summer session at the Duke Marine Lab. And then after that started and sort of TA'd a class in ocean engineering at the undergraduate level, around 10 students. We built um, some low cost sensors for the Wendy Schmidt Ocean Health X Prize, uh, which we did not win. Uh, but that, that's what got me interested in, in ocean sciences and ocean technology. And I went to the joint program at MIT in Woods Hole, um, working under the direction of Professor Henrik Schmidt, 
mostly in marine autonomy and how acoustics, embedded acoustics, plays a role in that. Um, so my education here was some coursework, largely um, not necessarily pure acoustics or, or physics, but engineering acoustics and applied acoustics. And currently in my, in my research at Woods Hole, it's a lot more acoustical oceanography, doing things I didn't get to do in graduate school, a lot more modeling, historical data analysis. The throughput through all of this is that um, a lot of this was by chance and that I'm going from here into a nonprofit or sorry, a, a for-profit startup role um, after, after my postdoc. Thank you. Congratulations on the new job. Oh, thank you. Um, Shannon Steele. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Shannon Steele. Uh, I'm a research scientist at Kraken Robotics, uh, which is a uh, publicly traded uh, for-profit company. Um, and so I work uh, mostly in uh, research uh, and development in uh, a couple of different uh, areas, such as, uh, well, in general, as in, we specialize in synthetic aperture sonar. And so I work in synthetic aperture sonar design, processing, um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, for object detection and things like that. Um, in terms of, I guess, how I got here, um, I'm from Canada, so I did my uh, undergraduate degree at Dalhousie University with, uh, I did earth sciences and oceanography. Um, and what got me into uh, sonar was actually when I was taking a remote sensing class and I did kind of my final report on uh, radar uh, sensing for uh, ocean bathymetry, where I found out that um, kind of like say this uh, Jebco image that I'm showing here um, is uh, most of our knowledge or kind of mapping of the seabed uh, bathymetry is actually really low resolution uh, and kind of just estimates based on radar data, so not really direct uh, estimates of the seabed uh, bathymetry and to get uh, you know, more direct estimates of seabed bathymetry, we need to use sonar. Uh, and so that's what got me interested in sonar. Uh, particularly, I got really fascinated with the idea of kind of a seeing with sound. Um, and so for do it for my kind of thesis uh, project at the end of uh, my uh, bachelor's degree, I really wanted to do something in sonar. Uh, and I was lucky enough to get put in contact with uh, the Defense Research Development Canada. Uh, so they do a lot of the um, uh, naval uh, research uh, here in Canada. And so I was able to do uh, kind of my end project on uh, modeling mid-frequency C4 scattering. Uh, and then from there, I uh, went to the University of New Hampshire uh, to do my master's degree in oceanography. And so I did that with the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping. Uh, and there I was looking at uh, kind of this wacky end fire synthetic capture sonar, um, where basically we took this sonar and uh, went out onto this ice surface and moved the sonar up and down to collect this wacky data, looking data here to form a synthetic aperture sonar time series. Um, so that kind of gave me experience in synthetic aperture sonar, even though it's not the same type of synthetic aperture sonar I work on now. It was certainly a good uh, background to set me up for my job that I have now. Yeah. Thank you very much. And just um, right now, you are at a for-profit private industry, correct? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Hillary Cates Varghese. Hi, everyone. Um, well, I will say that I uh, prepared something a little maybe more in depth than you're looking for, so I'll try to breeze through it. But um, I work for the federal government now. I work for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management as a technically a marine biologist, but uh, I call myself a marine bioacoustician on my business card. Um, so yes, try not to get into the weeds here, but um, I started my acoustics journey in my undergrad degree. Um, I went to Cornell University and uh, joined a club called the Wildlife Society, and we took a tour of Chris Clark's um, lab of ornithology and 
He talked about whales calling in New York City Harbor. And ever since then, I was hooked onto this topic. Um, I didn't have the privilege to explore that there. Um, and so I kind of became uh, went down the path of trying to get into a PhD to, to study marine bioacoustics. Um, I uh, worked for a biofuel company uh, before applying for PhD programs. And I thought it was worth noting that uh, the first time I applied to PhD programs, I did not get in. I also applied to um, three different um, fellowships, the National Science Foundation, G GRFP, the um, National Defense, NDSEG, I can't remember the full acronym there, and the Hertz Foundation. So happy to dig into, into what that was like. Um, but the big takeaway was that I didn't have a, um, a, enough quantitative skills to get into a PhD program in marine ma mammal bioacoustics at that time. So I um, went to the local university near where I was working and um, pursued a applied mathematics degree. And um, unfortunately, this program, uh, fortunate for them, unfortunate for me, this was a program geared towards math teachers. So it's really hard to find acoustics in this, but um, I did take several um, uh, courses that that helped me later in life, including differential and partial differential equations. And I uh, pursued a project, a capstone project on sound propagation. Um, also included in this, uh, in my time in my master's degree, I uh, joined a lab group um, of biologists that were using acoustics to study wasps and bird behavior. Um, I also worked on a citizen science project censusing frogs in southwestern Florida um, based on their vocalizations. And then towards the end of my degree, I uh, applied to Gen Mix's old sea bass program, which is a, a one-week crash course on bioacoustics. And um, that's when I had the opportunity to meet her, who, and she became my later PhD advisor. And this is also when I first heard about all of the, all of the, the choices and careers um, outside of academia. And uh, the first time I met someone from the bureau I now work for. Um, so the master's degree was really just a stepping stone to reapply to PhDs. And so I did that, uh, eventually landing at the University of New Hampshire where I looked at the effect of ocean mapping sonar on marine mammals. My degree there was in oceanography. Um, and as a PhD student in oceanography at the University of New Hampshire, there's very few courses that you have to take other than the four core oceanography classes. But I also took courses in ocean mapping, digital signal processing, spatial statistics, time, time series analysis, underwater acoustics, and several marine policy classes that I was interested in. Um, the most valuable piece of my PhD experience, though, was the fieldwork component, and I got to go on four different uh, research cruises and learn how to calibrate and deploy and, and use both passive and active acoustic sensors. Um, and then towards the end of my degree, I took one of those marine policy classes, and um, our professor was a previous NOAA employee, and she brought in a lot of guest speakers, including someone who worked for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, and I connected with him afterwards and learned that they had a center for uh, marine acoustics that was just forming. And so I, I stayed um, alert to, to what was happening with that. And finally a position opened and I applied and uh, the stars aligned for me. And now I'm a marine bioacoustician at Boom. Thank you. Um, I think our, our last panelist is Laura Van Oflin. Hello, I did also have a slide, which is mostly pictures. Um, and I, I wanted to just show some pictures on the top uh, really are from um, my journey and on the bottom are uh, from some students um, that I have. So uh, I'm an assistant professor right now in ocean engineering at the University of Rhode Island. I also have a joint appointment in the Graduate School of Oceanography at URI, and I did my PhD at Scripps in oceanography. So my undergraduate degree is in engineering, and I think ocean engineering was a good place um, for me to fall then, although I always say my, my work lies somewhere between science and engineering. 
so in my in my role as an assistant professor, I teach I teach undergraduate and graduate courses. I actually just gave um, my last lecture on Thursday for an undergraduate course that I teach in underwater acoustics. That's required of all our ocean engineering majors. Uh, I'm interested in long range acoustics, long range acoustic propagation, and um, also receiving on mobile platforms and particularly in Arctic acoustics. So that picture on the top right is me uh, in the Beaufort Sea with the uh, U.S. Coast Guard cutter Healy in the background um, deploying sea gliders. Uh, my lab at URI is called the Opera Lab. Um, we don't sing. This stands for Ocean Platforms, Experiments, and Research in Acoustics. And this really gives a hint at how I ended up in underwater acoustics, which is through my interest in music. So I was interested that Ishan brought this up too, but the reason I'm in underwater acoustics is really, um, really due to chance. I was an engineering major and undergraduate, and I had a um, I was doing a minor in music, and I planned to do um, acoustic consulting. And I was working as a junior consultant in an architectural acoustics firm, and I was looking for you know things to do during the summer before my senior year. And I came across um, an advertisement from the Marine Physical Laboratory at Scripps, um, you know, for underwater acoustics, and I had never heard of it. I didn't know it was a thing. Um, but I wanted to go to California for the summer. I was living in Michigan. Uh, so I, I ended up there um, and I had an amazing summer. Um, I went on a couple short cruises. And like Hillary said, I think the field work really, really hooked me. Um, and I want to I want to um, highlight in what I say today, the, the importance of mentorship, um, because I think that really played a really big role for me. Um, that summer I was an intern, I met Katherine Kim. So she was, at the time, she was a senior graduate student working with Bill Hodgkiss, um, but she was chief scientist of the cruise that I went on. And I think it really inspired me to see a young woman in that, um, in that role, in that leadership role, because I could see myself doing it. Um, so um, Catherine, you know, remains a, a, a friend and a mentor to me, a friend door um, to me today. She's now president of uh, Green Ridge Sciences. Um, but that summer, she and other researchers that I worked with, they they sent me a poster um, the, of the Ansel Adams print of Scripps Pier, and they all wrote notes on it. And she said to me, hook, line, and sinker, baby, because she knew that I was hooked, and I did. I came back, um, and I did my graduate program there, even though before that summer, I had, I didn't even know, you know, that underwater acoustics was, was a career path. Um, on the left side, this is a, a picture from my PhD defense at Scripps. So Peter Worcester on the right there um, was my graduate advisor. Um, he's another reason I'm still in underwater acoustics today. He was a, an excellent advisor. Um, he gave me solid advice, taught me about integrity in research. Um, he gave me credit for what I did when he presented my research. He introduced me to a lot of people um, and gave me responsibility when I was in the lab and at sea. So I, I think I was a pretty lucky graduate student. I had a really great um, graduate experience. And um, you know, that's Walter Monk also. Um, uh, in the picture, he was on my PhD committee, and he was also a real source of um, inspiration for me. After I left uh, Scripps, um, I was an assistant researcher for a few years at the University of Hawaii. Uh, I had a peer research position there, um, but I did have the opportunity to teach one course. It was a graduate course in observational methods, and so I took students to see on the Kila Moana, and I really, I learned that I love teaching, and so that how I, um, you know, I started looking for tenure track positions after that, and that's how I ended up at URI. Um, so I was recommended for tenure and promotion uh, very recently, so that'll be effective July 1. I think I just squeaked into this early career panel, um, but I really wanted to emphasize the importance of mentorship um, through that experience as well. Things don't um, you know, come to a halt when you graduate um, from your PhD program, and Kathleen Wage, who's shown here in the center, this is when I was a grad student, she was on my PhD committee as well. Um, she went to see with me and has, um, you know, been a mentor for me kind of through my PhD and also through the years that follow, um, particularly through the tenure track process. Um, Kathleen is a full professor in electrical engineering at George Mason University. Um, and, and she's also an exceptional teacher. And so um, she's somebody I learned from um, when I was building, you know, my teaching program. Um, she's actually receiving the Rossing Prize um, for acoustics education at um, and giving a lecture at the ASA meeting uh, next week. Uh, so 
I, I try to pay it forward uh, with mentoring my students. The pictures on the bottom are of um, my students. So on the um, the upper right there is a former and current PhD student, Luis Pomales and Chris Graupe. Um, so, you know, have them do these outreach events. Um, this one's called Science Saturday, where they communicate about acoustics to the general public. Um, I think it's important to get students to see. So the bottom picture is one of my former uh, master's students, Wendy Snyder. Um, she did a glider deployment uh, in Daybob Bay. And then the picture on the bottom left um, is a group from a cruise um, that I took out to see just around the Block Island Wind Farm at URI. Um, so these undergraduate students designed a passive acoustic system and deployed it out there. And so I think that was a really important um, experience for them as well. So kind of to summarize, I think maybe that was a little long-winded, uh, but to summarize, I think there's there's three really important um, uh, components for attracting and um, retaining a workforce. And one is to, you know, make get the word out, right? Um, I, I ended up finding out about it by chance, but we, you know, finding a way to attract um, good students um, to provide hands-on experience, you know, going to see, I think is a real hook for a lot of students. And then also to provide um, opportunities for mentorship throughout the journey, not just through graduate school. Thank you, Laura, and congratulations on your promotion. That's great, great news. And I, I think Ulick had two slides that he didn't get a chance to um, talk to, so we can throw those up before we start going with questions. Yeah, thanks. I think I missed the memo on uh, sharing slides there. Um, I just got three short ones to introduce myself. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I'm actually a biologist uh, in background. I got my bachelor's of biology at George Washington University and got interested in working with uh, fisheries um, by studying salmonids in the Patagonia steppe. Um, I actually took a fairly long break between my bachelor's and my master's um, where I worked in different industries. And I got back working into fishery scientists, science by actually working as a, a ground fish observer in the Northeast Fisheries Observer Program, uh, which sent me out on over hundred different fishing vessels for different lengths of time. And it kind of put the, uh, the issue of fisheries collapse front and center for me, which inspired me to pursue um, an internship at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. And I joined that internship um, in the summer just for three months and was handed a, an echo view dongle and told to uh, analyze a bunch of herring acoustic data, which is really interesting because we were studying an inshore herring stock from an industry led survey. Um, and that was kind of the, the entry point for me to start working in hydroacoustics. Um, I continued to be a technician in uh, analyzing acoustic data while I did my master's, studying the uh, age structure response of groundfish um, to marine protected areas in the Gulf of Maine. And right as I was finished my master's, I kind of had this acoustic skill set that I had built up and I was looking for a bunch of jobs um, around the New England area. And there wasn't really anything that suited the skill set at the time. Um, and so I kind of opportunistically found uh, an opportunity to, to go do my PhD in Canada. So I moved from the US to Canada to Memorial University in Newfoundland and um, was given uh, tons of opportunities to go into the field to do, um, to do research on, on these two species mostly, uh, lanternfish, um, which occupy the deep scattering layer of our global oceans. They're super interesting fish because uh, they have complex scattering patterns. Some of them uh, bear swim bladders. Some of them have lipid-filled swim bladders that change uh, across ontogenetic stages. Um, but they're super important to the global car carbon cycle, and uh, we're learning about their distribution towards uh, towards the Arctic as we expect warmer waters to be kind of moving their way further and further north. Um, and the other fish that I study is is, is polar cod, which is the most important uh, fish underneath the ice. And it's not a challenging uh, species to study using acoustics because mostly we have to measure them under the ice um, in the high Arctic. So we typically use um, uh, things like moorings. Um, and so, yeah, my career is kind of a combination, has been a combination over the last like, eight years of fishery science, um, biological oceanography, and marine ecology. Um, next slide, please. And so during my PhD, I uh, I've continued to use my acoustics as a tool for consulting. Um, lots of people out there um, have been needing folks to do data processing. So that's kind of what I've um, supplemented my income with. 
And uh, most recently I joined ASL Environmental Sciences. Um, and so ASL is a small company in Victoria that manufactures the acoustic zooplankton and fish profiler. Um, so it's primarily a manufacturing firm um, that's been selling these products to scientists um, for many years now. Um, we also have a field services division where we deploy and recover moorings for folks. Um, but most recently, uh, the company has decided to move towards data processing. And um, I've been hired as the first biologist at the company to lead their biological studies consulting program. And so I basically help uh, students work, I mean, sorry, not students, um, clients work with uh, echo sounders to understand the uh, spatial and vertical distribution of zooplankton and fish in their studies, help them design their studies, do the analyses, and um, I'm developing software for automation and things like that. Next slide, please. And just to give a, a kind of a broad overview of the, the tools that I use in acoustics, um, we use, I use all-mounted acoustics on ships to map spatial patterns. Uh, most recently, I've been focused on um, the deep scattering layer in mesopelagic fish and zooplankton in um, Canada's, high Ar Canada's subarctic and high Arctic environments, um, mostly in the Labrador Sea, but moving all the way up to northern Greenland. Um, I also use vertical profilers. So we mount um, autonomous echo sounders to CTD rosettes or on standalone probes. And we do this to kind of get a more continuous profile of the full water column so we can actually um, look at deeply scattered uh, individual targets um, within the deep scattering layer and below. And then a lot of the work I've done over the last several years has been the, the deployment of moorings um, and analysis of these moorings underneath the ice um, along around Baffin Bay, um, working with folks in the Beaufort Sea um, in Greenland. And these let us measure the kind of temporal processes over the season. Particularly, we're interested in what's happening um, during periods when the ice breaks, during periods when uh, ice melts. Um, so yeah, these are, the, these are the tools that I've been using over the last several years. Thanks. Thank you, All right, we're going to move into the question and answer portion of our panel now. And I think that everybody did a really good job of saying um, what experience or experiences kept them in the field or inspired them to, to get into the field. Um, but just so we get this in our transcript formally, um, I'd like each panelist to go through and answer the question, what courses experiences or skill development opportunities best prepared you for an ocean acoustics career? And I'm going to go in the opposite direction right now and ask Laura to start. I did. Um, courses. So the courses I had at Scripps, I think, were, were really useful. Um, I remember a um, a computational ocean acoustics course from Bill Cooperman that I model my uh, graduate level propagation course after. Um, that one was really important for me, I think. Um, and also, I hadn't realized um, before I started a graduate program, right? Uh, I think one of the difficult things about this field is that there's so many things you have to know <laughs> because you need to know some oceanography, you need to know some physics. Um, you need to know some um, signal processing, right, which is really electrical engineering. And so I don't think anybody comes in with all of those skills, right? And so um, I think the an important piece is, you know, putting those, putting all of those together. And I think most people end up, you know, leaning in one direction, but you really have to have a working knowledge of all these different areas. Um, I also took digital signal processing, which is the first I, you know, had heard of that when I was in um, graduate school as well. And so I think that's also a, a really important, important class to take. Um, and yeah, like I said, I mean, for experiences, really, it was that internship that got me. And I think internships um, are just hugely important for, um, for students, right? For, you know, for actually doing something, not just sitting in a classroom, but, you know, doing something where you can see yourself contributing to the science. Thank you. Andrea, do you have a follow-up question or, because I want to hear from all the panels on this question before we go to another question. Yes, I have a follow-up for Laura. Okay. Um, so Laura, since your situation is a little unique, because now you're an assistant professor, uh, it, now you have students that come to you. So I'm curious if you could also answer the question from the perspectives that may, of the students that maybe join your group. 
So what are some of the courses or experiences that they come in that best prepare them to work with you? In that's ocean really, in particular. Yeah. Yes, that's a really good question. And, and, you know, like my answer is kind of based on the way that I mentor them. They come in in ocean engineering and they're not required to take any digital signal processing. So a lot of my students, I send them to the electrical engineering department and I say, you know, take some DSP. Um, I think that's really important. Um, I also uh, recommend that they take oceanography um, pretty, you know, pretty soon on because I think it helps give a better understanding for for the acoustics and, you know, how, why it matters, right, and how it can apply differently in different situations. So I think it's important to take that kind of zoomed out view um, to understand why you're doing what you're doing. Thank you. That's helpful. Perfect. Thanks. I'm going to go to Hillary because we just want to hear from all panelists on this question. Um, so for, for my job, I think the most useful skill from my academic life um, is being able to write and communicate. So kind of <laughs> very different from what Laura just said, but um, yeah, I, I have to um, basically distill technical information into a way that the, the public can, can understand it and um, use it. So I think, yeah, I think I'll just leave it at that writing. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, so I'd say uh, I particularly uh, what I have found the most useful in terms of coursework has probably been uh, the ocean mapping and underwater acoustics courses that I took that took at UNH. Those definitely gave me, I think, even just like a lot of confidence in terms of what I understand about uh, the world of acoustics, especially in underwater acoustics. Um, I also really appreciate, I guess this is kind of echoing what some others said earlier, but in terms of, especially in my master's degree, I got to do a lot of, uh, you know, my own field work and design my own experiment and everything, which I think is kind of rare for a lot of people in terms of their master's. A lot of people are just handed some data and told to do some analysis. So I think, uh, yeah, more master's degree with a, an experimental design component is always uh, good, and I think that really helped me quite a bit. Um, yeah, and a signal processing as well is a, a big one that uh, kind of anybody in acoustics, I, sometimes I find it kind of funny that you know, say at ASA, there is a, a signal processing section because it's like, well, we all do signal processing in a way, but um, so yeah, definitely always digital signal processing. Thank yeah. you. Yishan? Yeah, I, my answer is pretty similar to, to Laura's, but if I have to make it slightly different, it's that uh, my background was mechanical engineering, but the courses that helped me most with acoustics were the ones in uh, computer science and electrical engineering, both at the undergraduate and the graduate level. So those looked more like um, just your basic computer science classes all the way up to um, statistical learning, artificial intelligence, machine learning. And I felt that um, that background has given me the most independence as a researcher and being able to think about not just here's how I run an acoustic model, but since my background is more platforms and underwater vehicles, how do I combine the, the or how do I integrate the, the mind of an acoustician into metrics or algorithms to operate on a vehicle independently? And so those experiences like first building some really small, not so intelligent ocean sensor platform, all the way up to working on, you know, a, a, a quite large, you know, 21, 21 inch bluefin. The, the, the range of the experiences is what's most uh, has been helpful over the initial part of my career. Thank you. You like? Um, thanks. Yeah, I think I have maybe a, quite a different perspective from the rest of the panelists. Um, I, the strengths in my early career, and I think what's led to the opportunities has been uh, my experience in working in the field and implementing data collection um, from the computational side and the understanding about theory and signal processing. A lot of it's been uh, just a journey on my own, <laughs> to be honest. Um, there was a couple instrumental courses that kind of were pivot points. Um, one, I took an international council for the exploration of the seas, also known as ICES. They hosted a course on acoustic abundance estimation led by John Horn and Paul Fernandez. It was only a one week course in, in Copenhagen, but I went there and um, learned about uh, using statistics to estimate the abundance of, 
uh, fish populations during standardized surveys. That was kind of a great starting point. Um, but it's really been individual kind of small workshops. Um, I'll put a plug in for um, Ocean Hack Week that Wujong was leading, get going there, meeting other folks that are working from the signal processing th side of things and the computational side of things, um, changed my perspective and gave me new directions to kind of investigate on my own. But I haven't had really any courses in, uh, in acoustics, um, apart from a one another one week workshop at University of Maine where actually an uh, optical oceanographer, Emmanuel Boss, taught us about wave theory. And that's kind of where, uh, where I kind of got my foundation in understanding acoustical theory. Excellent, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to another panel member to ask a question they may have. Go ahead, Gail, your hand is up. Oh, you're on mute. You're on, oh, you got to unmute. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question that's opposite to Jen's question. Uh, if you could have had a course or an opportunity um, that would have better prepared you for your career, if wishes were horses, in other words, um, what courses would you wish you could have taken? People can just jump in on this one. Go ahead, Yule. Yeah, that's a great question, Gail. Um, I think as other as others have mentioned, um, to be successful in this field, you have to have a combination of uh, oceanography, physics, signal processing, um, and contextual kind of understanding of what you're studying to be really good. Uh, but if there was a specific course, you know, I've heard great things about this Friday Harbor course. I think some of the, several of the folks here were trained there. There was a course um, hosted at Friday Harbor, which was like a month long bioacoustics course um, that included uh, both passive and active acoustics. Um, and it just sounded like a great a great immersive course that gave folks the experience. And um, I think my generation is probably missing out uh, on that opportunity to do an in-depth course like that. And it's something that I'm trying to kind of boost some energy around recreating that um, by getting folks, yeah, the experience of working on the water, collecting the data and, um, and then understanding the theory behind it. Andrea, your hand is up. Do you have another question or did you want to follow I up? I do. I do. I'll, I'll ask after. Okay, the rest great. Of the after yes. yeah. So, yeah, we'll, we'll keep going on which opportunities or courses do you wish you could have had? Uh, for, for me, I think maybe more on the computer science uh, end of things. Uh, so, like, even things like... Uh, we're in my company, we use Git for uh, all our change uh, uh, tracking in our code base. Um, and so that was very new to me and something that I uh, had to kind of learn uh, on the job as I go. And um, I think maybe in academia, since you're kind of working on your own, you don't worry too much about collaboration tools, but uh, uh, kind of learning how to use Git and collaborate in that sense would be great. I kind of also wish I had learned maybe some other uh, programming languages other outside of uh, MATLAB and Python. Um, so C, uh, kind of some faster, I guess, programming languages that we end up using in, in industry. Uh, and so I kind of wish I was able to dir directly write my code in C instead of kind of writing it in MATLAB. And then we kind of pass it over to our software developers who kind of either write around it in C or even rewrite some of it in C. Uh, so yeah. For me, some more computer science focus. Thank you. Laura? Yeah, I'll say, um, you know, I think uh, when you're in graduate school, your, your um, classwork can be very focused on your research area, right? So I feel very confident about my research area, but acoustics is such a broad topic that I feel like I probably know enough to be dangerous in a lot of different areas, right? But for example, like transducers, I've never taken a transducers class. Um, and so, you know, I, I know what I know about transducers and I can apply some things, but I've never had any formal education on that 
topic, right? And that's the way that a lot of people interact with acoustics, right? So through sonar systems and things like that. So I think uh, a course in that would be useful. I don't have a specific course in mind, but I just feel like um, I would have wanted to take a deeper dive into into most of the the topics that everybody else has shared. Um, like I feel like I got a, a pretty superficial um, understanding of just about everything that I needed, but um, I feel like sometimes, um, you know, if I if I had a deeper dive into something, it might have stuck better and. I might be able to pivot um, into another direction. Look, for example, in in, um, in my agency, we have um, like a biology team, and then we have an acoustic modeling team. And and though I I could probably stretch into the modeling side, um, I I just I didn't take a deep enough dive that I feel completely comfortable doing that. But of course, you know, like everything else, you can't know everything. So um, you just have to kind of learn it as you go. But that's my thoughts on that. And Ishan? I think I would, uh, it's funny, I've never taken a robotics class, even though that was probably what my PhD was. And the, ro the thing I'm thinking about in terms of the robotics is, everything we're doing in the field is these integrated systems and our field in particular, we're doing integrated systems on the edge of where they're all gonna fail, in the water, under the ice, what have you. And so being able to have a more professional background in saying this is how you make something and make it work consistently in the ocean instead of feeling like I'm helping everything together would give me a lot more confidence in going forward in, in, in projects that didn't have to rely so heavily on data analysis, modeling, simulation. Awesome, thank you. Andrea, do you wanna go with our next question? Sure. So a couple of you mentioned having opportunities to do short courses or trainings outside kind of your formal um, education. And I'm curious if you one could elaborate on um, how you found those, how were you aware of those opportunities and um, then two, kind of the value that you got out of them um, and how that supplemented your more formal educational path. Go ahead, Julie. Thanks. Um, I, think, uh, I think just being aware of the different, like working in fisheries, for instance, being aware of the different management agencies um, and the kind of the work that they're doing. There's a lot of working groups um, and cooperative reports out there um, that have really, I mean, they're like Bibles to me for um, solving sonar problems. Um, and so I think those working groups um, are a great start. Um, I joined the working group for fisheries, acoustic science and technology, um, which didn't really require any challenges to enter. I mean, I was, I'm a practitioner, so they said, sure, you can join. And um, through that, uh, they posted a very, very basic uh, email list, uh, an occasional newsletter, and they would, they would share those courses and I would jump on them immediately, apply, try to get student funding. Um, both, both of the two or three of the ex external courses I took, I took one on fisheries acoustic abundance estimation with ICES. I took a geostatistics course with a heavy hand in, in acoustics. And, um, and this Ocean Hack Week, and each of them provided student funding for me to go. Um, and it was very easy, easy for me to participate in those. Um, sorry, you had another second part to your question. Did I answer that? Uh, yeah, I think you touched on it. So just how it supplemented your formal education. Yeah, I think they were really powerful. And they, not only did they give me the tools I needed to train, but also just gave me a different perspective. Um, for instance, Ocean Hack Week showed me there's a whole computational side of this and coding in which we can solve problems. And there's ways to do this working in teams that I hadn't really seen before because I've been working on my own a lot, doing a lot of my own problem solving. So that was great. Um, so yeah. Any other panelists wanna 
jump up, oh, Hillary? Yeah, so, sure. Um, so I did uh, the the CBAS program, which <laughs> Jen could tell you the what the acronym means, but it's basically a, a one week um, bioacoustic crash course in bioacoustics and um, uh, the organizers bring in, you know, like 10 different um, representatives from the field, including people from the government, um, including academic researchers and just just younger, generally, it seems younger uh, folks in the field that are, you know, are willing to connect with students and um, possibly even take on students. So in, in that sense, um, for me, it was critical in actually breaking into the, the field of bioacoustics, because before that, um, before I had the opportunity to attend that, um, yeah, I, I wasn't in the field. I was doing a master's in math. Um, so for me, it was absolutely critical in getting into this field. And I'm so thankful that someone, uh, I was on the wait list. And so someone else decided they needed to do field work and I got to go in. And so uh, I think my whole life depended on that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so networking uh, was a really big thing for me for that, and I, I suspect for other people. Um, uh, I also mentioned that um, they brought in people from the bureau that I now work for, and that was the first time I'd ever even heard of them, um, and they were absolutely wonderful people, and um, yes, that paved the way for me wanting to work here eventually, um, so all those soft but important uh, aspects of a, of a course. There was also a lot of good information in the course, too. <laughs> Laura, Shannon, or Ishan want to jump in. Laura does. Sure. I don't I haven't taken any short courses like that. Like most of my education was, you know, through graduate school, but also through um through cruises. I loved going to sea. And so this was I think pretty well known about me when I was in graduate school. I wanted to jump on any cruise that anybody had. And I think I learned so much from that. So it's not a formal course, but there's a lot of um, experience that you gain just from, you know, being being on a boat for a month. Um, you know, you, you learn a lot that you never would in a classroom or a short course like that. And I also um, want to emphasize what Hillary said too about, um, you know, these, these networking opportunities, you get to know people on a different level when you spend a month on a boat with them, right. And, um, and so those connections too are also really, really important. Um, also, the Acoustical Society of America, I think is a really um, great society. It's a great way to network and um, their website also has a lot of these opportunities, you know, that people can find out about them. like I think is yeah I just wanted to follow up on what Laura said yeah I didn't really mention the cruises I mean I've spent a crazy amount of time at sea over the last six years that uh, has been instrumental in my problem solving and thinking about things um, one example of a, a kind of hybrid cruise educational opportunity that I did was the um, Sentinel North PhD school that's based out of the University of Laval in Canada um, Obviously, it's not an American example, but I've seen American examples pop up. But these these graduate student training schools on the ship are so 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 important. And um, the one I did gave us uh, experience in all different types of instrumentation, but also we had projects and we worked on a paper together. We wrote together, and um, I think that was huge. So there's it's definitely an understated part I think of training is going out to sea, and that, and that, it's also a challenging one when talking about how do you create opportunities for students? Not everybody can go to sea. Um, some people just get seasick. Some people just can't do it because of family obligations. So I don't think that that should be the the one, um, but it was a driver for me and it sounds like it was for Laura too. I would add on there exactly as Julius just pointed out, I didn't get to go to sea that often, but a lot of our field work was on the river, you know, next to the campus or when we were down at Hui, we would, drive to a nearby pond and throw something in the water. And so I actually did my scientific dive training to be able to recover vehicles that we lost while we were working with them. And so having a very accessible um, body of water to put things, put your platforms in, and it's not like a month long thing, but it's that you can show up and we're here all day, come as you please and, and figure out how you can help out in any way. That was a really very informal part of why I'm here today. I thought of an, a, another point to share, if we still have time. 
Okay. Um, yeah, I uh, attended this program, a, another week long class at the University of Buffalo, and I, I'll have to look up the name and send it to you. It was really long, but it was um, uh, hosted there. But and I think they have a linguistics program. So the the program wasn't actually like marine bioacoustics. It was just acoustics in general and, and a lot to do with signal processing. And so there were people there that were studying birds. There were people there that studied speech. Um, and and then there were people like me that studied marine mammal bioacoustics. So that was really unique in that sense that we we all had like you know the the same um, computational problems to solve, but but different context for for what that was. And so it was just really interesting to get in a room with people that you know have this common theme of acoustics, but of uh, but different needs for it and. Um, I think that I think Laura brought it up before about the Acoustical Society of America, and, and I think that's another uh, great aspect of of that society. It's just that you're you get people with that common interest of acoustics, but um, there's just so many ways to spin it. Um, so that that's super valuable. Any other comments on this question? One once, one twice. All right, thank you, Andrea. Carolyn, your hand's up for the next question. Hi, um, so let's move away from the education component because we all went to grad school and we all did our thing and we all took trainings and everything. So I'm, I'm kind of interested more in um, sort of your perspective as relatively early career people on the health of the field writ large of ocean acoustics and whether that's informed by say your experience looking for jobs or how many people you see around you in the field or um, the nature of the work that's available to people who are trained like you're trained, et cetera. So just kind of leave it open-ended. So your interest, can you just phrase that as a question, Carolyn? No, okay. I, I can't. So maybe someone else, or just forget it. Don't. No, no, that's good. I think, are you asking about um, what the, the, the panelists think um, are the current job markets in their area of expertise? No, not necessarily. I'm asking about the generalized health of the field. When I was an early, sol early career seller as geophysicist, I knew the field was basically dying. So I abandoned it okay, and became a marine geophysicist. And, and that was obvious from the funding streams. It was obvious from the number of people going into it. It was obvious from the lack of ability to do active acoustics in the ocean, et cetera. So I'm asking sort of what the sense is of the health of the field, but whether that can be informed by what the job market is like or how many people they see around them at their career stage or something like that. Perfect, that's a great question. Who wants to jump in first? Laura. I'll jump in. Um, so I think I think it's healthy. So I when my students graduate, um, I have a lot of people contacting me to ask, you know, do you have any students who are graduating soon? But I think a lot of that is influenced by where I'm at. So I'm in Rhode Island and there is the Naval Undersea Warfare Center, you know, right across the bay. And there's a lot of defense contractors um, located in the area. And so um, in that sector, I think there are a lot of opportunities um, because I think a lot of that workforce is nearing retirement. And so I think they are actively looking for, um, you know, talent to fill those roles. Um, and I think there is a little bit of a hole. Um, I joke with friends of mine, we look around at the Acoustical Society of America, and I still feel like, you know, one of the younger ones at a, a lot of the time, right? Um, and so I think there is a little bit of a hole in this mid-career um, um, you know, age group of uh, the workforce. Um, but I think the need is definitely there. Um, and I think for students coming up, I think they will have a lot of opportunities, particularly in the defense sector where I'm at, but I think maybe other people want to comment about other sectors as well. I'll jump in. Thanks. Yeah. I, so I would say I'm adjacent to the defense sector and Similarly, all my mentors have been great and they've all been semi-retired or on the cusp of retirement while I've been under that. I think I'm the last student for a couple of them. And it's been a privilege to be under 
a long chain of networks. Every time I go to an ASA meeting, it's very easy to meet people who are in the same circles. Um, that being said, when I was looking for jobs, I wasn't trying to find something that was purely in the defense sector. I'm really most motivated by what's the kind of ocean technologies we can use that are going to be important as our oceans continue to change in the next 10, 20 years. And I have a harder time seeing how ocean acoustics itself plays a role in that, especially in terms of, let's say, any sort of carbon mitigation, but maybe more so on the quantification side. So in my head, I'm, I'm betting on ocean technology being quite important, but I wouldn't necessarily even call myself an acoustician, more of a technologist where acoustics is the first thing I go to in, in, my, in my toolkit. Good point. Uh, Ulick, you had your hand up. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I've got uh, two lines of thinking on this. One is your question about the health of the field. And I think I think about this quite often because I don't really know how to assess the health of the field. And I'm kind of, I have the privilege of being able to compare Canada and the US because I've worked in both, um, both environments. But one thought that I have about just the health of any field really is looking back at the history of what I do, fisheries acoustics or biological hydroacoustics. One measure of health might be how, how much is the field making an impact on science outside of its field? And so there used to be that people could publish methodological papers till the cows came home. They would just improve their methods, new target strength models, um, things like that. Um, I think the health of the field to see it grow, you would see people moving away from methodological applications and moving towards, you know, ecological insights, what this means to carbon, what this means to, to sustainability, what this means to fisheries. And I don't think I'm seeing enough of that in our field um, per se. And so in terms of health, I think we might be kind of just spinning the same wheels over and over again. And sure, it's employing people and getting them to think about tough questions. Um, but in terms of impact to the field, I'm a little bit worried about the future um, in that sense. Um, as a, from a Canadian microcosm, right? Because there's not nearly as many institutions on our side. There's probably only a handful of people that do the type of analyses that I do. Not that I think mine are particularly challenging, but there just aren't really many acousticians in the country. So I work for one of the only firms that does hydroacoustics as a service. Um, and I'm approached frequently by academic institutions and nonprofits from around the, say the global North who need, who need data processing skills. And when I think about the future of my position at the company, for instance, I don't know who I'm going to hire <laughs> if I need to, if we, as we expand, I don't really know that there is like a university that's pumping out students that have the skills ready to enter the workforce as at the level that it's needed. So yeah, I think that case might be a little bit different in the US um, just because you have a wider range of diversity. There's obviously a lot of universities in the US that have um, acoustical training where folks with signal processing and computer science skills could probably jump in and do the work that I do fairly quickly. Um, but oftentimes those folks don't have the, I would say the level of uh, confidence in biological studies to really apply their skills. Thank you. Shannon has her hand up next. Yeah, I would agree uh, quite a bit uh, with uh, you there. I guess I am on more of the Canadian side of things than anything, um, but I think it's a little bit similar in the US in that I think there's lots of uh, jobs or possible uh, industries that could uh, use uh, the acoustic uh, um, or an acoustician's expertise. I think there's actually a very uh, difficult uh, kind of like maybe pipeline to get those with the expertise to industry. So uh, for example, when I joined Kraken, they actually didn't have an advertisement or anything. They weren't like actively uh, searching for new scientists, but um, I just kind of sent my resume to them and they wanted to hire me and they specifically told me, they're like, yeah, we don't put out 
advertisements for uh, scientists, especially in the acoustics uh, area, because it's so difficult to find them. It was like, you know, the chances of one being available when we decide to put up a listing is quite low. And so um, from like a, my experience, it's very much that companies would like to have um, these type of expertise, but they're so hard to find um, that they're not often very ac actively advertising for them. And so they more just go off of, you know, chance connections that they happen to uh, come across. Um, so I think maybe that's an area where we can improve is trying to match those things up uh, a little bit better so you don't have to kind of really try to hunt down your own connections to get a job in the sector that is definitely needing, that definitely has jobs available. Thank you. And Hillary, did you have anything on this question before we move to the next? Yeah, sure. I mean, I would say um, from from my perspective, um, there's a healthy need for acousticians, bioacousticians, um, you know, in the government, in industry, um, anything related to anthropogenic noise and and impacts to marine life. Um, yeah, it's it's a growing, it's definitely growing with um, offshore wind. So I see the jobs out there being endless, but yes, like tackle what everyone else is saying, the bodies to fill those roles. Um, yeah, I, I think there are some people, but <laughs> will there be enough? Probably not. Oh, thank you. Um, I think Wu Zhang, you had your hand up for another panel question or a committee question, sorry. Up oh, here. Uh, so my question is more of a follow-up to what we have just been talking about, because a lot of you mentioned that um, you sort of stumble upon the opportunities to go into acoustics, right? And then like some of the panelists mentioned that, you know, depending on which industry you're sitting in or which perspective you're from, you may or may not, may not see a lot of needs from sort of different different sectors. Like, what, what do you think from your perspective that can change that in a way? Like, if, if, if there is a need for people on specific areas, how do you think can be done to maybe expose more people to know about this field, right? Because a lot of people sort of stop on, stumble upon it, right? So, so what do you think can be changed? Go ahead, Laura. I'll, I'll start with that one, um, just because I've seen it within the past week. Um, so I, I think it one strategy is to target people who are already interested in the general area. So I teach in an ocean engineering department. Um, so the course I teach is for undergraduates. It's an undergraduate underwater acoustics course, and it's required of all ocean engineers, whether they're going to be going into robotics, whether they, they're interested in, you know, offshore wind, um, you know, whether they're interested in, in waves, right? And so... Um, I, I've had this, right, where I, and it's a it's a pretty general course. <laughs> it's crammed into one semester, right, and it's kind of half um, physics, right, um, Snell's law, sound speed profiles, uh, things like that, sonar equation, and then it's kind of half signal processing. So they do FFTs, spectrograms, match filters, right, um, and so I, I pull my class, I've actually done this within the past week, you know, I, I try to see, you know, what are the most important things that you've thought you've learned over the course of the semester. And a lot of them come back with comments like, I, I never thought about it before, right? Like I just, it never crossed my radar, my sonar, right? And it was, I would have been in the same boat. And so I've had students, you know, say, I'm interested in this now. This is something that I would like to pursue. And so I think a lot of it is that exposure, right? And, and I love that course, right? For that reason, because, you know, most of them, they have no idea why they're there, right? They're, they have no idea why they need to know about underwater acoustics, but I try to emphasize, you know, no matter what you're going into, if you're doing it in the ocean, chances are you're going to be using sound at some point, right? And so, um, you know, that that's from a from a more pedagogical point of view, I guess. You know, put it in the curriculum, um, but but also internships, I think, are great. Other panelists have want to respond to that question? Yeah, I can just add on to that a little bit. Um, I think um, I think oceanography courses are probably the best way in to acoustics. Um, and I think 
like for instance, um, I've been invited to to um, instruct at a biological at a, during an oceanography course here at the Banfield Marine Science Center. That's where I'm based, um, and it's a it's an undergraduate course. And we've got a physical oceanographer and a biological oceanographer, and they wanted to kind of meld the two by in including uh, acoustics. And so that's kind of something that I'm going to introduce. But I think if 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 acoustics became part of general oceanographic curriculum, because it's such an important aspect of understanding physical and biological processes, just kind of standardized, like just across the board, then I think we'd probably get a lot more um, folks who get inspired by, by things like the sonar equation and um, what that can tell us about big ocean processes. Thank you. Ishan has his hand up. Hi, I, I Thanks for mentioning that element of chance. I, cause I, I think that's important for the for my answer too, is that it just so happened that the undergraduate institution I went to had a marine lab. So I think going forward, if we're trying to attract a broader audience, these courses about oceanography can't only be in places that are on the ocean, can't only be in places that have marine labs, because most people who are interested in STEM or whatever you want to call it, don't go to places that are on the water. That, that's a huge privilege that really filters who gets into the field in the first place. Anybody else want to respond to Wu Zhang's question? Oh, uh, yeah, one thing I guess maybe I'd add is maybe uh, like I think uh, in terms of like some of like, you know, like place like earth scientists or, you know, um, you know, that's kind of my background. And I think a lot of earth scientists don't have a lot of confidence in their math and physics abilities. Um, and so, and especially, and maybe I think a lot of people with say biology uh, backgrounds as well, but there are people who could be very interested in doing these acoustic analysis. So I think uh, maybe really trying to find ways to encourage them to get engaged with it. I particularly noticed, like, say, even when I was doing my undergraduate thesis, like, that was, you know, going and doing sonar. Like, I really knew nothing about sonar. I even told the DRDC before I did my thesis. I was like, I know nothing about this. And I really didn't understand a lot of it going in, but I kind of learned a lot of it along the way. And, you know, it's not something special about me. It is something that any other earth scientist could do, but they don't, I think, have the confidence in that. Like a lot of my friends were like, oh God, I could never do that. Like I could never, but like you can, you just have to have the confidence and the willingness to learn and maybe um, try some of these subjects that you haven't been so uh, heavily educated in. And so maybe like you know, I think maybe like these short courses are good places where you could get earth scientists um, bio and uh, biology people kind of to learn just enough of the math and the physics that they need to be able to do some acoustics type studies and give them a little bit more confidence. Like, yeah, I can learn some signal processing and then maybe they'll go take more courses once they've seen they can learn some of it in a mini course. Thank you. Um, I, I saw other hands from our committee members go up and down. Does someone? Jen, I don't know quite how I raise my hand on this. Sure, go ahead, Art. Let me ask a question of uh, our students and early career people. Um, my perception is that the depth of math and physics that is now being taught at uh, universities, and particularly the one I'm familiar with, is certainly not as deep a uh, field that I experienced and experienced it many decades ago. Uh, you know, for example, uh, one in math, I'll give you an example. It was routine for someone in my field, electrical engineering, to take a course in complex variables. Um, it, someone in physics, uh, I had a number of courses in quantum mechanics, and I don't see that depth being taught in today's undergraduates. The reason I bring it up is I have found subjects such as that to be incredibly useful in hopping from fields to field and, uh, and enabling a, a background where you can enter these fields uh, w without a lot of entry fees. And I'm just wondering the opinion of 
our audience here, our, our, our colleagues here, what, what, what is their perception? Are they adequately trained in math and physics uh, or should we have more? There are people of my generation who think it's not quite enough anymore. Uh, obviously, yeah. the situation is changed because what, is, what now exists is, is that's the vote of the faculty to make that the curriculum. Well, I think the question is, is there enough math and physics? Is there enough math and physics, basic math and physics that allow people to go among many career choices throughout their lifespan? Panelists? I can weigh in. Oh. oh Hillary, then Laura, then Ishan. Um, I, I think it depends on, you know, what what degree you're talking about. Like I have a undergrad degree in biology and if I had stayed in biology, then it would, what I had was sufficient, which was two statistics classes and calculus. Um, but, but switching into, you know, acoustics, absolutely not. <laughs> I went and got an entire master's degree in math. Um, and even then <laughs> I could use some more. So uh, I think it depends on that. And I guess we're talking about acoustics. So, um, but the, but the thing is, there's no, you know, there's no undergrad degree in acoustics, right? As far as I know, um, it's right. maybe ocean engineering or um, I, if oceanography is an undergrad degree, I don't think it is. I think it's usually master's or um, PhD level. So um, yeah, maybe there needs to be an undergrad degree in acoustics or, or something um, more fitting for that transition. Uh, Laura? Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point, Art, and it's something that we talk about in our department a lot. Um, particularly, I have a colleague who does um, wave analysis and tsunami prediction, and he's constantly frustrated that there's not, you know, good enough um, math courses, math and physics. And I think, I think they are not as rigorous as they used to be. Um, and I think a lot of that may, I, I'm just, I'm just, I've been thinking a lot about this lately because of chat GPT, right? So we've been having a lot of discussions about what is necessary to know, right? And what is necessary to be able to apply or to calculate. And I, I wonder if, um, you know, the move away from a lot of the rigorous math has been because it has become easier to implement these things computationally. And so I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, um, but I, I I think you may be right that it may not be as rigorous as it used to be. But I think I think maybe a lot of that may be because of um, you know computational. What about the competition for students' time? You can only have your attention for so many hours. The competition for students' time. Yes. In their time, and their what I mean is time at the university. We can only we can only teach you so many subjects. Let's hold off on a second question. We have two more people wanting to answer the original question first. All right, then. all right. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. I think I, in my head, when you say that, you know, the math and the physics are these two pillars of maybe our field, in my head, there's a third now, and it's, it's computational skills. I feel like don't embarrass very little, You're probably embarrassed by my answer. That's okay. We can talk about it later. But the, uh, I feel like there's, if, if you look at the current literature, there's very little being done that doesn't necessitate some kind of high computing, big model that wasn't available 30, 40 years ago. So it, it's a valid question. And those math and physics, those principles are embedded in these models. People are writing wrappers for Fortran models that were originally built right by people who might have just just had these a lot more intense undergraduate graduate education in math and physics. I think the hard part to answer that it's competitive time. What I might have learned in math and physics, I spread out in technology that didn't exist 40 years ago. Thank you, Shannon. Um. Yeah, so I would like, I guess maybe even my previous answer um, kind of connects to this and that coming from an earth sciences oceanography background, I'd definitely say that we could use more math and physics in those programs. Um, I certainly, when uh, I got to grad school, I uh, 
did uh, some auditing of some math courses until I had enough math to actually take some grad level math classes. So I definitely played a lot of catch up on the math end uh, coming into grad school. Uh, but I would also like to uh, uh, kind of, I got to agree with Ishan in that I think the other aspect is the computational end. Like, you know, also just knowing math isn't uh, enough anymore. You also have to know how to uh, efficiently and correctly program that math and actually, you know, use it. And that, that's actually a much more difficult skill than you might think it is. Like sometimes I might be reading a paper and I may understand some of the math behind it, but if I were to implement it myself, that would be a very difficult undertaking. Uh, so I think a little bit of both of those would be great, but again, it is like a time efficient they see thing like maybe it is better in grad school maybe once you've kind of can kind of start to appreciate why you need those uh things more i certainly didn't appreciate maybe the math as much as i as, as i should have in undergrad uh, i didn't take any more than the required math which uh similar to hillary i think was just maybe some stats and uh some calculus uh and so yeah i wish i had some more of those even now <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. Um, we have, about, have time for one more question. So I want to jump to Liesl. She's had her hand up and waiting um, patiently. So Liesl, you get the last one. Oh, thank you. Um, hopefully it won't be too much of a long one, but thank you all for all this great conversation and your discussions. We really appreciate it. I wanted to pull on a thread that I've heard a little bit before and um, the potential role of professional societies as a student or as you're building your, your careers. Have you been members and did you experience any like short courses or professional development or and or networking opportunities? Were they remotely helpful in you building your career? Yeah, professional side societies question, Yulek, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I think that's actually been the, the place where my inspiration and education has been like most energetic and galvanized has been through societies. Um, it's a very useful. Um, the working group on fisheries, acoustic science and technology was a really great one. Um, every time I attend a conference, it feels like a full educational experience that fills a lot of the knowledge gaps that I need. And um, they do provide some short courses. So I think that's, for me, that's been a major driver. And I recognize that's mostly because I'm playing catch up, like referring back to the past question. I'm the guy who looks at the papers with all the equations and kind of freaks out a little bit less so these days you know I'm kind of catching up to that but um, my my journey from being a biologist to being an acoustician has been mostly due to um, that society or that that working group go okay, Ishan and uh, thank you yeah I'll say the professional society uh, ASA is the reason why I or I have and, and secured a job going forward. It was through contact initially from field work, but I've been able to keep in touch with several people over, I guess, seven, eight years now at ASA meetings. And you know, they're, they're pretty small meetings. So it's been able to further professional connections and just be able to see other fields that use acoustics instead of just always being in motion acoustics. Laura, you had your hand up. Yeah, I will also say that I think, um, you know, membership in professional societies, particularly the Acoustical Society of America, has been invaluable for my career. And when I was a student, I was, um, you know, the, the chair for the student group in acoustical oceanography. And so it gave me opportunity to, you know, present for that technical committee. Um, and it, it helped me to meet a lot of people in the field, right? So I think it was really, really important to, to get connections. And then Hillary and Shannon. I, I agree <laughs> what everyone has already said about the Acoustical Society of America. Um, I only actually went to one conference in person, but uh, just from that one experience alone, I ended up with an internship with the um, Acoustics Today Journal. Um, I ended up being the um, the student council representative for animal bioacoustics moving forward. Um, so yeah, I, I haven't been back to a conference during my professional life, but I hope to just trying to get everything under control first. 
And Shannon. Um, yeah, not a whole lot to uh, add on my end. Uh, yeah, ASA is great. Uh, I really like IEEE conferences as well, although they tend to be a little bit larger. Uh, but, you know, sometimes in your smaller sessions, you can make those connections. Uh, yeah, but other than that, like outside of some of these uh, professional institutions, I've actually had a lot of interactions, even say just on LinkedIn, I think is actually still a very relevant place to have a, a profile, I'd say, especially if you're interested in, in industry. So a lot of people have contacted me through LinkedIn about job opportunities and things from the industry. And so I find maybe like ASAs and uh, conferences are great for kind of your academic connections, but um, for industry, they're not always quite so present. They might be a little more present at, say, IEEE conferences, uh, but yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I, I'm going to, because we're, I, you, everybody's had a first chance to answer here, but what I'm going to do is, um, instead of asking another question, we're going to just ask for last comments from our panelists so we respect everybody's time and and then somewhat on time so in one or two sentences if you have a last thought that you would like to impart to this committee um what would it be go ahead you look um first i just want to say thank you for the invitation this has been super interesting and and fun and it's great to see a bunch of new faces which i've never seen before um I will say that when it comes to solution, that I think the problem that we're trying to solve here, um, whether it be a working group or a course, it's really interesting to see how we all differ so much in terms of our backgrounds. And I don't think there's a solution for everybody here in the room. Like we all would probably have a lot to talk about over beers, but I don't know if um, we would, like a short course would be able to fix any of our kind of lack of education because we all do such different things. And so, yeah, I just want to impart that um, whatever solution to education comes up with is really dependent. It has to be kind of diverse, has to have multiple options to, to address the people who don't do so well in math and science classes, but do really well in the field and vice versa. Um, there's, there's multifaceted um, ways to solve this problem. Yep. And I agree with you. And I just want to let you know that the, the committee's task really is to assess and recommend. I don't think that this committee of just five or six or seven, I can't remember how many we are, is going to solve anything. But I hope that we do a good job of putting recommended recommendations out there at the end that other agencies, sectors, people, academia can think about solving or at least improving moving forward. Um, last thoughts? from others. Shannon, go ahead. Um, I could go next. I guess maybe my last thought is uh, kind of coming towards the end of my master's. I was, you know, really searching around, like trying to f find a job or anything. But, you know, when I kind of went to Tony, I was like, I can't find any jobs that you know, are advertising for somebody with like a master's in oceanography. Like, should I just do a PhD? Uh, and uh, Tony, my advisor, his kind, but he said to me uh, that really stuck with me is that like nobody knows you as like in all your specialized no knowledge exists. Like people just don't know that your skills kind of even exist necessarily. And so they're going to have to meet you first and find out what you're capable of. Uh, and then they'll want to hire you. Uh, and I found that to be very true. A lot of the kind of opportunities have come my way have been from people kind of like talking to them and then finding them finding out what kinds of skills I have and then them being like, oh, you'd actually fit really great here. So I think um, maybe we need to find more ways to kind of bridge that connection in terms of both making students aware of what they need to find a job. I think especially coming out of grad school, your your skills start to become so specialized and specific. Uh, it can be hard to find that uh, match. And then the same thing on the industry side. I think it's, there's a lot of confusion as to like, you know, what type of skills industry is even looking for as well. And so, um, yeah, I don't have anything specific other than uh, my experience kind of coming out of the end of my degree was navigating that area was a little confusing and I think maybe even like letting students know like you're gonna have to really try and find your niche and find your own uh 
uh, you know, positions might be important to know and that um, just because they're not kind of visible on the surface doesn't mean they don't exist. You just might have to dig around a bit. Thank you. Laura, Hillary, Ishan, one or two sentences on, on thoughts? Yes, sure. Um, I was going to just say when we were talking about um, uh, conferences, right, that I think they're so important also because nobody gets into ocean acoustics or engineering because they like to present or they like to write. Um, and so I think it also gives students a good um, opportunity to do those things, which they will be doing throughout their career. And um, the ASA in particular has built, um, you know, a pretty friendly atmosphere. And I think that is so important moving forward is this idea of, um, you know, having a community. Um, nobody nobody gets where they are on their own. And so I think it's really important to have, um, you know, opportunities for mentorship and, um, you know, bringing up younger people in the field and and lifting them up, right? And and showing that it's not it's not a competition, right? We shouldn't be com competing with, um, you know, people who are just entering the field, but um, helping them along and mentoring them. Thank you. Isha? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we didn't get to chat about this today, but in this, I guess, in assessing and recommending the ocean acoustics workforce in its future, um, I hope the committee has time to also delve into the demographics of that workforce and the pipelines that contribute to the workforce. Yep, that is actually the word diverse is actually in our statement of work and we will have a panel on that later. And um, the survey that the committee has worked with the consultant to go out to the, the general community as a whole, um, which will should be out next week, starting with ASA, there's a lot of questions related to demographics and how we can better track that, understand it. So when that survey comes out, I'm sure you'll all get a copy of it. So send it to as many people as you can, because the more information we have, the more we'll be able to address that um, diversity issue of all types. Good point. And Hillary? Um, I'm not sure that I have a, a great answer, but um to the point about diversity i guess i i would just um maybe encourage you guys to to reach out beyond the ocean acoustic community maybe to the broader acoustic community there's a lot to learn from you know parallel fields and and what is or isn't working in those and pull that in um so i guess just you know keep thinking outside of the box like if we keep talking to only people that share our common experience, then we might not gain as much as if we can, you know, find ways to reach out just a little bit further. So um, not much to offer there other than think think outside of, of us. <laughs> that is a great recommendation. And um, one of the things you'll also see in that survey is we've talked amongst ourselves and settled on some language, ocean acoustics and supporting disciplines. And so all of that contributes to our knowledge in ocean acoustics. How we define those supporting disciplines is ever expanding. Well, we are over time. I apologize for five minutes being over. Um, that's my job. But I wanted to take this time to thank all of our panelists and all of our committee members for taking time out of their day to share their thoughts and their path and um, their opinions about the future. And we hope to do a, the best job that we can in incorporating all of those as we move forward. Anybody from the um, committee want to say any parting words? So I, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> um, this is Gail. I just want to also say thanks. This was a very interesting conversation and um, I certainly learned a lot from you guys and keep doing the good work that you're doing. And I hope to see so many of you at ASA next week. Okay, thanks. Right. So thanks, everybody. Um, and just one note for committee members, please jump over to the other Zoom link for a, our closed session. But thank you all to the panelists. Um, really appreciate your time to echo Jen's comments. Thank, thank you so you. much. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.